Okay, come on, sir. We can. Wait. <laughs> okay. Pour vous, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Pour moi, bonjour. <laughs> uh, mon français est très pauvre. Malheureusement, uh, I have to speak in English. But if we do this again, what I would like to do is translate the slides into French and also I would prepare a text and speak to the text uh, en français. Pour maintenant en anglais. Je m'appelle Robert Leblanc pour en anglais Rob White. Uh, il y a 40 ans, quand j'habite uh, la, la ville d'Ottawa, uh, a long time ago. So, I have connections, uh, mon équipe et les arts, um, the Canadian, um, et peut-être also, aussi, uh, pour le CFL, Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Anyway, that's my introduction, but I'm here to speak about green criminology, key concepts and issues. If I speak too quickly, ask me to slow down. Uh, if there's something that you don't, understand, then ask me to, to stop and I'll try and explain what it is. Uh, we'll see how we go. Um, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to repeat every word on every slide because that's boring. Uh, I'm not in fact going to go through every slide because um, some of them are interesting and some of them are less interesting. So what I'll do is I'll stop on and pause on some of the more interesting slides and talk through some of the issues that way. Now I'm looking over here. Can you see me okay? Uh, yes. And the slides are okay? So I think we can begin by saying where I'm from. If, well I can't because it's not moving. Okay, great. For uh, more. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's okay. okay. Now, this is an important map. It shows where I live. I live in the island of Tasmania. Tasmania. Uh, Donna Bay de Australie, uh, I live in Hobart, Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, the interesting thing about this map is that I'm in the center of the world. <laughs> uh, whereas a lot of the maps that you'd be used to would have Australia way off to the side. And I think the purpose of that map is to show that where we live really matters. So if we live in Canada, if we live in New Brunswick, if we live in Moncton, then that shapes how we look at the world. In the case of Moncton, you might be looking across the Atlantic, uh, you might be looking north to the Gas Bay uh, in, in the Quebec, uh, you'd be looking south, of course, um, to the United States and so on. But where we live shapes how we look at the environment and indeed how we look at the world. <coughs> this is where I live. And sometimes when I present, I say, uh, I live at the end of the world, and I speak about the end of the world. So, uh, as we'll see a bit later, I will be speaking about climate change, and that certainly has implications for the kind of world that we live in. The important thing though here is that where we live matters. We have issues in the Maritimes in Canada, we have issues in Tasmania as an island state of, of Australia, uh, and these are unique to where we live, but also there are global issues. We are all part of one world, um, but we do have local specific issues of concern. Today I want to talk about green criminology. I, again, I'm not going to read everything on the slides. I'm not going to repeat the stuff on the slides. Uh, if I would had more time, I would have tried to translate the slides for you so that it would have made it a bit easier. But certainly the, the slide's fairly clear that Green criminology has philosophical, theoretical, and practical dimensions. And at the end of the day, uh, we're concerned with issues of harm and justice. Uh, and the question is, what is the nature of the harm, and how do we construct or conceive justice? And so I'll pull apart some of those dimensions as we go through the presentation. In the second half of the presentation, I want to show more recent work that I've been doing on climate change to illustrate how we can use some of these concepts in application to climate change. If we look at it from a traditional criminological perspective, 
We want to look at certain types of offenses, offenders, victims, and responses to environmental crimes. Um, but again, uh, what we look at is very much shaped by what I'm about to discuss. That is, things like legal definitions, uh, ecological notions of harm, and, and also a, a strong recognition that not all that is harmed is human. And as, you, as we'll see very soon, the, some of the key victims of, that we look at in environmental criminology or green criminology are non-human victims such as ecosystems, rivers, mountains, non-human animals, and, and indeed plants. So this initially reflects a, a straightforward criminological orientation, looking at offenses, offenders, victims, and, and responses. Uh, if we start with conventional criminology, then we'd say that the key issue is one of legality. And if you look at environmental crime, strictly using the, the lens or categories of legality, then we can divide activities into legal and illegal types of activities. Um, and what you notice right off the bat is that very often when we talk about the environment, uh, many of the activities that we study as crimes, in fact, are perfectly legal. So it's a question of regulation that makes them illegal. So for example, in Tasmania, we log forests. So logging is perfectly legal, but under certain circumstances is deemed to be illegal. Fishing in the Maritimes uh, off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland and so on, uh, and the lobsters off of Prince Edward Island, uh, those are seen as legal activities, but under certain circumstances they're seen as illegal. So from a purely legal perspective, uh, certain strands of green criminology would look at things like the illegal taking of flora and fauna, that is to look at non-human animals, uh, to look at uh, CITES, which is the Convention Against the Internet, uh, Illegal Trade in Endangered Species, and be looking at plants and animals that are traded illegally, um, but otherwise can be traded legally. So if you've got the right permits and papers, uh, you can in fact trade in species. Uh, you, if you've got the right permits and papers, you can fish. If you've got the right permits and papers, then you can um, engage in, in, in logging. Um, so again, the key category here is legality. Same with pollution. What is pollution? Pollution basically is people who are not permitted to pollute unless they have permits. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of our pollution is perfectly legal. Air pollution, water pollution, and land pollution associated with industry um, is perfectly legal. Uh, and from this approach to criminality, that is a purely legal approach, so that we can have big smelters uh, that accompany mining and, and production uh, that pollutes the air, but that's perfectly legal, uh, unless it's made illegal through, through people saying that um, you're not allowed to pollute beyond these license provisions. Uh, if you look at our rivers, uh, often the laws allow pollution. So in fact, most of our laws relating to pollution are enabling pollution, not stopping it. Um, the transportation of banned substances, likewise, is a, another area where there have been international treaties uh, that relate to the banning of the transportation of radioactive materials and the illegal transfer of hazardous waste. The point about conventional criminology and how it approaches environmental crime is that the key issue is one of legality. However, if we, if we look at it slightly differently, an ecological perspective says, well, no, it's, the key issue is not just one of legality. The issue is one of sustainability. So what we want to look at is, are the practices we engage in in relation to nature benign or destructive, regardless of legality? So for me in Tasmania, we look at the forest industry, and I would ask the question, is the, the clear fell logging of bold growth forests a good thing? And if I use an ecological perspective, I would say no, because in fact, they're, they're, getting, they're clear felling. Clear felling means that you take everything. You basically bulldoze the forest in total. And from an ecological perspective, that's disastrous. Now, it's perfectly legal in some situations in Tasmania to do that. But from an ecological perspective, 
perspective of sustainability that is wrong. And the key things that an ecological perspective brings to appreciating what's happening in terms of nature and natural resources, uh, the kinds of issues that an ecological perspective brings would be the problem of climate change. So what are the activities that are contributing to global warming? Uh, the problem of waste and pollution, um, not just in terms of legality, but overarching issues say that it doesn't matter whether it's legal or illegal pollution of our waterways and of our air is a bad thing and the problem of biodiversity what's happening uh, to the species around the planet and we know that there's a recent united nations report it came out about a month uh, three months ago that said that we are facing one million species going extinct that's one million species that are threatened with extinction. Now, I want to emphasize, extinction means it's gone forever. Okay? So that's what extinction means. It's gone forever. And we are facing the possibility in the next 10 years or a few years of one million extinctions. Unfortunately, my country, Australia, is one of the worst when it comes to the number of species that are actually becoming extinct. So from an ecological perspective, the issue is one of sustainability. In a sense, the ecological perspective doesn't care whether something's legal or illegal. If you're cutting down forests and you've got the legal permits, if it's not sustainable, then there'll be a critique from an ecological perspective because they're saying it's not sustainable. The third perspective is, is really what I call the green criminology perspective that focuses on the question of justice. And I'll come back to this shortly. But basically, here, the issue is weighing up different kinds of harm and the violation of rights in the context of what I call an eco-justice framework. And to put it simply, the way I conceptualize it is that we can talk about environmental justice that deals with environment rights relating to humans. We can talk about ecological justice that deals with notions of ecological citizenship and the, the way we're intertwined with complex ecosystems, and we can talk about animal rights and species justice um, as a distinct area of justice where we, we have to take into consideration the rights and welfare of non-human animals within environments and so on. So from a green criminology perspective, we want to talk about justice. Underneath and underpinning these notions of justice, uh, I'll come up here, are different philosophies of nature. So. Uh, the, the main approach to nature adopted by governments and big companies in the world today is anthropocentric, that is human-centered, and it, it expressly includes the idea that humans have a right to do whatever they want to the rest of nature. Non-human nature and species are viewed instrumentally. Um, a biocentric perspective basically says that human beings have the same moral worth as other species on the planet, but basically a green criminology perspective is more ecocentric. And it says that we, we, of course, we have to have a balance between instrumental and intrinsic conceptions of non-human nature. Um, we're using technology that implies that we are, in fact have engaged in mining because we have technology and components that, that put together these instruments whereby we can communicate across the planet. Uh, I, I walked in through a wooden door, so I'm not necessarily against the use of nature for certain products and so on, but we want to do that in a balanced way that's ecologically sustainable. And that's, that's the important phrase. It's not about sustainable development, it's about ecological sustainability. Social justice from an eco-centric perspective, is equally important to the questions of, of eco-justice more generally. A more radical version of green criminology, green criminology has many different component parts. There is no one perspective. So a conventional green criminology perspective only looks at illegal activities in terms of uh, the, the, the crimes against uh, what I said before here, the illegal taking of foreign pollution offenses and so on, uh, how, 
green criminology wants to talk about justice, but in critical green criminology, then locates the discussions within the context of political economy on a global scale, uh, often providing a substantial critique of global capitalism as part of the political economy of the destruction of, of natural resources and of the planet. Uh, and particularly looking at the harms perpetrated by nation states and transnational corporations. Uh, in the green criminology literature, particularly the critical green criminology literature, of course, there's a lot of discussion of, of activities such as the Alberta tar sands, because the Alberta tar sands actually is a disaster for the environment, for the indigenous people, for the local ecology, and it's going to have long-lasting effects. So from a green, critical green criminology perspective, we'd be looking at what, which companies are involved with the Alberta tar sands, look at the provincial government of, of Alberta, look at the federal government, uh, and look at how you have basically different forms of state corporate crime and collusion for the perpetration of, of quite profound environmental harms that, by the way, on a global level, uh, though tar sands are the leading contributor to greenhouse gases from Canada. So a political economy approach, we talk about those things. Critical green criminology also emphasizes ecology. Ecology, in this sense, incorporates both abiotic elements, such as air, water, soils, and so on, and biotic elements, uh, ecosystems, biodiversity, the plants and animals, and so on. So we want to look at not only the non-human animals, the, the birds, the bears, uh, the moose, the deer, and so on, but we also want to look at things like the rivers and, and the air itself. Um, and of course, we look at species, but when we look at species from a critical perspective, we have some of our uh, writers in this area talk about not only the aggregate rights and status of plant and animal species, but actually the individual rights. So I have a colleague in Norway who writes about the wolves and efforts to protect the wolves in Norway, which have not protected in the rights of individual wolves, which have been killed by the government because they didn't fit the breeding program. And she's argued that it, it's one thing to, to protect the wolves in aggregate that is, as, as a whole, but we also need to talk about the, the rights of that individual wolf not to be put down, that is to be killed because it didn't fit the breeding program. So these are the kinds of issues that green criminology, a critical green criminology, would raise. If we extrapolate from this and put it to a criminological context, uh, in particular in terms of victimology, we can see that environmental justice basically deals with the question of humans. Um, and in a moment, I'll, well, in fact, I might jump ahead. I'll go I'll through these slides slightly differently. But environmental justice deals with questions of, of humans um, and the quality of humans in relation to their environment. So the victim in this case is human. And if you, if you think of this uh, environmental justice in terms of social movements, then it would be movements like the environmental justice groups, uh, particularly associated with the United States, I guess. Um, in the Australian case in Tasmania, we have the Toxic Action Network. But basically, they're looking at the questions of, of humans, victims of environmental harm, differential victimization, um, and if you want to take ex uh, particular examples, we can talk about Bhopal in India, we can talk about BP in the, in the Gulf of Florida, we can talk about Total, which is the French oil company that had a major spill off the coast of France, um, and we can look at the implications of that for people affected by these activities. Uh, there's the movie um, Aaron Brockovich, uh, which is an old movie now, but Julia Roberts, um, hang on a sec. There, can you see that? Uh, um, it's the movie Aaron Brockovich. Uh, Julia Roberts actually won an, an Academy Award for it. But it deals with the case of environmental injustice in the United States and how she was engaged in, in a lawsuit uh, as, a, as a researcher, a lay researcher, uh, to expose the toxic damage to residents in an area that has been polluted. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we would do from the point of view of environmental justice. But the key thing is that it's humans who are at the center of that. 
but also on ecological justice. And again, we can hook that into particular social movements. So here, the victim is specific environments. And uh, here we have the, the movement of societies, the, the green movements, the conservation movements. Because they're not necessarily talking about humans, they're talking about specific environments. So here's an example here, you have ecological justice. They've been calling for things like net more national parks, protection of national parks, uh, protection of marine sanctuaries. Um, so we would argue for it. We, we have this debate right now in Tasmania that we don't want more tourism in some of our protected national parks. We want to ext extend the marine sanctuaries. Uh, we know that in the United States, um, and I think this is a swear word in any language, uh, Trump is, is allowing the desecration of many of the national parks. Um, and so this is associated with issues of conservation, land management, uh, and certainly in the Australian case, in the Tasmanian case, there's been long, uh, we've had calls for many years to, to ban uh, logging in old growth forests. And some of the groups that you'd be familiar with, particularly in Canada, would be Greenpeace, um, trying to protect uh, the specific environments uh, Greenpeace Amazon is very active, of course, in the Amazon with Brazil, Colombia, Peru, so on, um, and so on. The third strand of eco justice and victims relates to species justice. And here, the, initially, most of the discussion over, over the first, say, 10 or 15 years uh, of, of the development of green criminology as such, most of the attention was, non, was on non human animals. But uh, people like myself and others are, are wanting to say that, look, species justice also pertains to plants, particularly if we put it in the context of biodiversity. Because biodiversity um, is vital to the planet and the resilience of the planet, especially in the light of climate change. And again, with species justice, we have a range of social movements that have emerged uh, that ask questions. Why are some species threatened? Why are some protected? Um, why is it that we spend so much time on the charismatic animals, the elephants and rhinoceros, when other creatures such as bees uh, are fundamental to, to ecology, and, but we don't have big campaigns around bees or protecting other kinds of animals? Uh, a lot of work, as we know, has been done over time on, by, uh, uh, against factory farms and the use of animals in labs. Uh, the response is animal protection laws. Big issues here in, in uh, Australia is to ban the live export trade. We export a lot of our cows, our cattle, uh, to Indonesia and to Malaysia, and to, well, actually Indonesia and to some Arabic countries in the Middle East. And but we do it as they, they are transported live, and that's that seems uh, particularly cruel. Um, in terms of activism, you might have heard of Sea Shepherd um, that is particularly um, concerned with the, the protection of whales. Um, as a point of interest, uh, the, I think the skipper of Sea Shepherd uh, for many years was a Canadian of the original Sea Shepherd. Uh, and the Sea Shepherd boat docks in Hobart when they come to the southern hemisphere and they, they watch the Japanese in the southern oceans. So we, in fact, some of my students have had research projects where they've interviewed members of Sea Shepherd um, and talked about radical environmentalism um, and why did they get involved in the, in the activities in the Southern Oceans against the Japanese whaling and so on. But you can see what I'm getting at here, that each of these areas um, deals with the victim constructed uh, and their social movements around that. So environmental justice and victims, <coughs> ecological justice and specific environments and ecosystems, species justice, and where the victim is animals and plants. That's a, a broad outline of some of the concerns of green criminology. And what I want to do now is, is give you an idea of how we can take some of those ideas and apply them to for what I believe is the vital issue of the present era. If this is something that affects all of us and that will continue to affect all of us uh, regardless of our age and regardless of where we live. And that of course is climate change. So I'm going to just quickly walk through 
how we might apply some green criminology concepts. Um, and there are five pillars, as I describe it, five pillars of climate change criminology. And the first pillar is to rethink what we mean by harm. And how do we respond to climate change from the point of view of perspective on harm? Now, we know that the way in which the law is constructed is that we have two types of harms in law. One is called malum prohibitum. Malum prohibitum is a fancy way of saying that uh, these crimes are, are criminal not because they are inherently bad, but because the act is prohibited by the law of the state. So that goes back to our earlier discussion of the question of legality. And as we know, that much of the constructions of legality are about the, the, the same act can take place and be both legal and illegal depending upon context. So therefore, it's a question of regulation. Is something legal or illegal? Uh, is fishing in one situation is legal, in another it's illegal? So that's an indication of what we mean by malum prohibitum. Uh, it's the law that says whether something's good or bad. However, there also is a concept in law called malum in se. And malum in se refers to the notion that there's something that is inherently wrong. There's something inherently bad. And that that is something that should be, regardless of its status, that we should, if it's not already, already made unlawful, it should be. And part of the aspiration of climate change criminology is to say that things that are contributing to global warming should be criminalized. Because the harm is serious enough that it should be considered malum in se. That is, that it is inherently wrong. So we have at the moment carbon emissions stemming from coal-fired power stations in places like Australia. That's what powers our, our energy. From a climate change criminology perspective, we, we would say that that's wrong because it contributes directly to the problem. Um, so these are the initial concepts re relating to harm. And the objective of climate change criminology is to move people away from the notion that these are, these are OK because they're legal and move towards the position that these are serious and bad in their own right. Therefore, they should be criminalized. That has implications, as we'll see shortly. So that's the first pillar of climate change criminology, harm. A second pillar is uh, basically <coughs> the notion of global connectedness and equal justice. That is, we have to look at the world as a whole. We need a global perspective because everything's interconnected. And if you're going to look at things globally, then it's clear. The connections are clear, uh, not only by looking at the fact that we're doing what we're doing right now, that we've got a global connection. I'm in Tasmania. I'm in Hobart, Tasmania talking to you in Moncton, Canada. Uh, extraordinary. So we're connected in so many different ways, but we're also connected uh, through things like ecology. Um, the complex interactions of non-human nature. Uh, ecology is basically about the web of life. That's what ecology is. The web of life does not stop at the border of Tasmania, at the border of Australia. It does not stop at the border of New Brunswick or the border of Canada. The web of life is what allows us and facilitates us to live as we do, um, but it means that we are all inherently interconnected. And of course, if we're going to talk about the web of life and ecology, then we've got to talk about eco-justice in its various components. So we need to talk about the importance of, of humans, uh, regardless of where they live and regardless of their status, their class, ethnicity, race, religion, and so on. We also have to talk about the non-human, the, the ecosystems, we have to talk about biodiversity, plants and animals, and this kind of stuff. And if we talk about global connectedness and eco-justice, then the bottom part of the slide is important. It says it emphasizes in what we call in Australia at the moment a, a form of southern criminology, which is basically the importance of democratic conceptions of perception, knowledge, and social interest, and contributions to global knowledge. So a large part of green criminology is more and more recognizing the importance, for example, of indigenous perspectives on nature, 
on the planet, on ecology, and also how to respond to the crisis that we face in the area of climate change, but, but to the environment more generally. So it's a democratization of knowledge and how we perceive the world. Part of the global connectedness is not only about ecology, it's about social con connectedness. So the views from the periphery, in fact, need to be put into the center. So the, the views from the Spanish-speaking world, from the Francophone world, need to be put into the center of the global dialogue, as do the languages of the indigenous peoples of the world, of the Amazon, of, of North America, of Canada. The Cree have things to say. The Maori have things to say. The Yamaji and the Nunga have things to say about what's happening to the planet and so on. A third strand or third pillar of climate change criminology takes us back into the more conventional criminological space and says, okay, if you're going to talk about harm and crime and connectedness, then let's talk about causes and responses. And let's talk about perpetrators and victims. So that climate change doesn't just happen. Uh, we need to talk about culpability, accountability, and responsibility. Now, we've known since 1992, at the very least, that global warming is damaging and that it's human caused. Everybody agreed, right? All the different countries agreed in the Rio Convention in 1992 that climate change. A was occurring and B was human caused. So if we've known since 1992 officially. Now, from a science perspective, we've known well before that. But the point is that governments have had foreknowledge of global warming and climate change since at least 1992. So the question is, how can we still allow it to happen? And that's the issue of culpability and accountability and responsibility. And the more you unpack that question, the more you realize that you can't just talk about governments. You've got to talk about companies. So if you want to look, for example, at the Alberta tar, tar sands, then you've got to look at which governments over time have been engaged in allowing what we, we know with foreknowledge, what's, what the consequences are in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. We've got to look at the governments, but we also have to look at the companies. Because too often when we talk about accountability and culpability, um, we leave the companies off the hook and we only blame governments. We also have to look at victims. And climate change criminology wants to incorporate the stuff that we discussed earlier. That is, that it's not only humans that are victims, but we can talk about it in terms of ecosystems, plant and animal species, and of course individuals. So we have to look at who's causing the problem, who's making it worse, and what are the consequences of climate change, which are differential around the globe at this stage, but it has universal aspects as well. So for example, the latest storm that hits off the coast of which you name your country, uh, whether it's Japan or the United States or whatever, there's always a typhoon, a cyclone, a hurricane, and these things are changing in character and intensifying, and there's more and more disruptive weather events occurring. At the end of the day, Everybody's affected. So uh, nobody can escape the consequences. So that's our third pillar, our fourth pillar of climate change criminology is to look at more closely um, the issue of power, interest, and justice. And we can frame this by in deploying or employing new concepts. So for me, a, a central concept in the area of climate change criminal, criminology is the concept of ecocide. Ecocide has different types of definitions and meanings and so on, but for my purposes, I de define it as the destruction and diminishment of environments stemming from systematic human interventions that pollute and destroy. And the more you reframe the climate crisis in terms of ecocide, then you can start to say, you can start to see that ecocide is, is not neutral. That it is, you can actually talk about who is, who's denying ecocide, so the so-called climate change contrarians. These are people 
who, regardless of the science, will always take a contrary view. So this is not about climate skepticism or even climate change denialism. This is about contrarianism. This basically says, I don't care about the science because my factory, my mine, my fossil fuels, my company needs profits. And we will do whatever we want, however we want, in order to make those profits. And it's government saying, we need to invest in business, and so we're going to mow down the forests in the Amazon. My promise as the new Brazilian president is to, in fact, not worry about indigenous rights, to not worry about the local farmers, but to actually allow commercial and agricultural developments to occur that will, in fact, diminish, actively diminish, the rainforests of Amazon. So we look at the question of power and interest. And if, if we're going to talk about the Amazon, by the way, we should be talking also of Indonesia. We have major fires in Indonesia every year because what they do is they burn out the, the, the rainforest in order to replant, um, in particular, palm oil. Palm oil is a very attractive uh, product. Um, it's, it's cheap, it's easy, it's lucrative, and so we're destroying rainforest in Indonesia, which is also having a knock-on effect because it's destroying the, the habitats of the orangutan and so on. The point of this slide is basically to say that at the center of climate change, the fourth pillar of climate change criminology is concepts like ecocide and always going back to that question of, of climate justice. The fifth pillar of climate change criminality, criminology I should say, um, is what is to be done. What is to be done? And here we want to look at things like the, the democratization of mitigation and adaptation strategies that are premised upon universal human and ecological interests. There's a lot of talk at the moment of these weird and wacky technological solutions to climate change, putting stuff into the atmosphere, covering the oceans with certain materials and so on, that somehow will uh, deflect the heat in certain ways and so on. And we're saying, well, hang on, we've got no say in the, the deployment of these technologies, and that's part of the problem. Democratization, as I see it, particularly in the context of climate politics, must include democratic decision-making over air, water, land, and energy. And uh, if that requires nationalization of industries around energy, for example, then so be it. But certainly there has to be greater democratic participation in the key decisions affecting the air we breathe, the waters that we use, the land that we need to survive in, and the energy systems that we, that we have. Of course, we also want to look at multiple sites of intervention, including in and against the state. Um, I'm more than happy to work with state agencies to help regulate um, uh, harms against the environment. Uh, I, I, am, I write in the area of environmental law enforcement. I have contact with Interpol and their environment crime group. I have contact with the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, which also are looking at environmental issues relating to illegal trade and wildlife. And I think working with governments and, and international agencies is an important part of the kind of work we need to do to stop the harm to the environment. But at times, we have to operate against the state. We have to demonstrate against the state. And we've seen with Greta Thunberg, just over a year ago, she was a, a sole one person sitting outside the parliament in Sweden saying, I'm on strike for my future because of climate change. Her protest has sparked a worldwide movement of, at the moment, 7.5 million people have taken to the streets. Uh, and you in Canada should be proud, particularly of Montreal, uh, where you had enormous numbers of people take to the streets as part of the, the climate strike. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that climate change criminology will look at and will study. So we're not simply in there to advocate and, and be part of those movements, which some of us are, but we also want to study, because we want to look at what is the role of the state. So for example, in Queensland, in response to Extinction Rebellion activities in Brisbane, the state government of Queensland wants to introduce new legislation that's intended to go against the protesters. 
So we're not introducing new legislation to stop the carbon criminals. We're introducing new legislation to stop the protests against the carbon criminals. So that's of great interest to climate change criminology because, frankly, uh, it's wrong. And we need to intervene in these kinds of debates over the, the politics of, of climate justice. So, at the end of the day, what have we learned? Uh, green criminology, as I see it, is comprised of many different elements. I, I've given you a snapshot today. Uh, I haven't really talked about environmental enforcement <coughs> prosecution. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work on environment courts and sentencing uh, and how the courts and police can be responding to environmental laws so that where we do have conventional crimes against the environment, there, uh, there are some important questions of are they being prosecuted, uh, what kind of conventions and laws are in place. Uh, we can look at the European Union, for example, on their directives relating to the use of criminal law against environmental crimes. There's some really interesting stuff there. I haven't talked uh, relating to environmental laws or related laws of the rights of nature and that whole development of, of a body of literature relating to the rights of nature, which is not only theoretical but practical. So our cousins across the Tasman in New Zealand have passed laws in the last two years that have given the rights of personhood to rivers. So these rivers now have rights. They have the rights of a person, of a legal person. And the rivers are being protected through a combination of the state working with the local Maori communities as stewards to protect these rivers. The Manganui River, for example. There's also mountain tops and mountains in New Zealand that are likewise, through legislation, being accorded rights. So this becomes, it's very exciting. And, but if you accord rights to a river or to a mountain, then you must protect it. And that's where we come back to criminology and the importance of talking about enforcement, prosecution, and investigating in, uh, sentencing practices uh, to make sure that we do protect. We, it's one thing on, to on, on paper to have rights, but you, you've got to protect the rights. We would look at things like the Ecuadorian Constitution, which entrenches the rights of Mother Nature, uh, but does it in practice. And in fact, there's contradictions within the, con within the Constitution. And if you look at what's happening within Ecuador today, there's, there's activities that are actually destructive of the environment. So we need to explain why that's the case. Um, we, we need to look at environmental regulation in general. So in Canada, you have, like in, a, in Tasmania, you have the salmon industry, uh, and you have salmon farming. So we'd be interested in what are the systems of regulation that can protect the wild salmon, that can allow fishers to, to engage in their farming activities and so on. Uh, what are the systems of administrative, civil, and criminal law that can be used and mobilized to protect species in the maritimes, whether it's lobsters um, or deer or whatever. Um, so we want to look at the question of environmental regulation as another big area of interest for green criminology. And of course, all, ultimately, from the, the point of view of eco-justice, yes, we can say we want to value and respect humans, ecosystems, and non-human animals and plants, but we need to go beyond philosophy. We need to go beyond broad moral statements. We need to say, how do you institutionalize ecocentrism within criminal justice. So how do you institutionalize ecocentrism within criminal justice? And again, in green criminology, we have done some work in that area. We've demonstrated how some courts have ecocentric criteria that they use when they assess cases. Uh, I'm writing up something as we speak, actually, of uh, the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales has uh, been involved in some recent cases where it's talking about um, it's stopping mining, actually, the mining developments on the basis of the impacts on climate, uh, as well as the impacts on local um, flora, fauna, and ecosystems. Um, so this is of interest at a practical level. It's not just theoretical. Uh, we've also done work on the greening of justice. So greening of justice refers to things like how do we use less fossil fuels in the administration of justice? Um, whether it's uh, putting police on bicycles um, or having uh, paperless offices in courts. 
so that instead of a whole bunch of paperwork using a force, uh, we can have electronic means. Of course, that raises the question of um, how do we deal with e-waste <laughs> and the pollutions associated with electronic waste. But nonetheless, people are thinking through these kinds of issues. So there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath some of what I've described today. But I hope it's given you a, a useful introduction to green criminology, its key concepts and issues. Uh, I'm always happy to be contacted directly on any of these kinds of issues. And I'm more than happy to provide resources of any kind that I can um, directly through HESA. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or to receive any comments.